They were now eight in number. Tebur's two explosive bowls had produced enough fire and flame to set off the rest of the supplies, save for the barrel that Malbach now carried. The conflagration had obliterated most of the Skaven horde. If not for a final burst of speed, Godric and Felix would now be nothing more than charred corpses, crushed into jelly when the passageway had caved in behind them. Gromnar was gone and presumed dead, although no one had seen him since the opening minutes of the fight. Gromnir's armor was so dented that he was unable to sit, and so he knelt on one side of the corridor, weeping openly. It was a rare enough sight among dwarves that none of them knew what to do about it, and every now and then one attempted clumsily to console him. Martinok had a deep gash in the leg that he sustained in the mad dash towards the corridor. He took a noxious-smelling black paste from a pouch at his belt, smeared it on the wound, and then briefly set it on fire, before hissing in pain and quickly snuffing the flame with his cloak. Privately, Felix thought that this treatment was worse than the wound itself, but in just a few minutes, Martinuk was pacing back and forth as if he was not injured at all. Balir's arms and chest were coated in blood, but the gruff Longbeard assured them it belonged to those he'd slain, for the most part. The Skaven had left Ulgar alone while they'd fought the Grey Seer. Maybe they knew better than to interfere in a magical duel, or maybe they were hoping that the runesmith would kill the Seer so that one of them could take its place. However, he was not unharmed. He'd sustained his wounds when he'd activated a rune to deflect Tebur's explosion. The runes at the top of his staff had heated to a searing white and then shattered, spraying shrapnel over the runesmith's shoulders and back. Thankfully, the magic had held out and they'd emerged whole from the corridor. Wolfheim stared back into the passage. Great slabs of rock and stone blocked the way back, and the smell of dust was thick in the air. Skaven dressed in dowie skins, he said. I would have never believed it. Though Wolfheim had been at the center of it, his armor and skill with a hammer had mostly protected him. The same couldn't be said about Malbach. He was bloody from a dozen different wounds, and he'd lost the tip of his ear to a Skaven blade. He was sitting apart from the others with Tebur's keg of black powder, still wearing the golden chain which had started the battle. Gromnir seemed to notice him sitting there and rose all of a sudden. Tears had carved a dusty path in his cheeks and soaked his beard. You, you did this he roared, pointing his axe at the engineer. You will die for what you did. He strode across the floor and swung at Malbach like a woodsman cutting kindling. If it weren't for Wolfheim's hammer catching the haft of Gromnir's weapon, the engineer would be dead. Calm yourself, said Wolfheim, and such was the fire in his voice that Gromnir took a step away. We are trapped in a hold full of Skaven with no book and no way back. We don't even know if Vabur Nerenson was able to alert the king to our whereabouts. This means that not only we are trapped, there might not even be a rescue coming. He sneered down at Malbach. The engineer might not be much of a warrior, but we will need every dwarf. And man, he said, nodding at Felix, to work together to return to our hold. Gromnir spat on the floor, but remained silent. They know we're here now, said Malbach. They'll come again in greater numbers. We need to turn back. There was such a note of despair in his voice that Felix almost took pity on him. Coddled by his father's money and power, assigned a prestigious apprenticeship under Godric, and then given a cushy job guarding the vault of Muzin Baldurk, he probably never set foot outside of Barakvar. Wolfheim, Godric, even Felix himself, were hardened to the terrors of battle. Malbach was not. That, of course, did not excuse his cowardice, but it did put it in a different light. That way is now blocked, said Wolfheim in disgust. And I wouldn't turn back in any case. We are here for the Book of Grudges, and I won't return to King Grundadrak empty-handed. 
Martinuk spoke up from the edge of the group. Sorry to interrupt your speech making, but I found something at the other end of the passage that you'll want to see. While the others had been arguing, Martinuk had scouted a hand. He took them down the corridor to a room that might have been a twin to the one they just left. The ceiling was so high, it was lost to the light from their lanterns. Instead of torches in iron wall sconces, the entire room was lit by an eerie green glow which came from a set of tubular tanks that lined either wall. Felix stared in awe at the tanks. Set in brass bases bigger than carriage wheels, they reminded him of nothing more than the glass tubes he'd sometimes seen imperial doctors use to store medicine. The glass alone was as tall as he was, and must have cost a fortune to produce. He wondered if even Emperor Karl Franz's personal glass blowers had the skill to produce something at this scale. Surely it couldn't be Skaven work. It had to be some forgotten technology left behind by the dwarves. Riveted copper pipes, through which murky fluid flowed, connected each tank to its neighbors, before rising upwards and disappearing in a tangle of metal in a hole in the ceiling. A low mist clung to the floor of the room that swirled into shapes that dispersed at the slightest disturbance. He felt like he was walking between the pillars of a temple to some forgotten god only recently reawakened. The air here was charged with evil, and reeked faintly of cinnamon. Ulgar, said Wolfheim, his gruff tone poorly disguising his fear. What manner of magic are these? The runesmith advanced on one of the tanks and studied it. A nearby pipe gurgled as something semi-solid passed through it on its way to the ceiling. Ulgar brushed aside his cave bear hood as if to get a better look at it, and then muttered a few words under his breath. The tip of the staff began to glow a soft magenta, turning the green liquid a bluish brown. Wearily, he tapped the glass with the tip of the staff. Clunk, clunk. Confident it was thick enough to resist a couple of blows, he advanced still further. Wiping a thin sheen of water droplets from the exterior of the tube, he cupped his hand over the brow and peered into the depths. A sound echoed back at him from inside the tank. Clunk, clunk. Ulgar looked back at the rest of them grimly. Felix wondered if anything could be living inside the tube, some horrible skaven experiment. They'd already seen ratmen wearing the skins of dwarves. To what other depths of madness could the skaven sink? Suddenly, he felt an urge to get as far away from this place as possible. Ulgar turned back towards it, and then reeled back with a shout as a dark face smashed itself against the glass from the inside. While the rest of them started, Godric merely stood there, arms folded. Bah, put away your weapons, he said in annoyance. It's not getting out of there. Felix was embarrassed to find Karagul in his own hand, and he wasn't the only one. Wolfheim had drawn his hammer and Martinuk his axe. As they put away their weapons, the slayer drew his and advanced upon the tank. Ulgar barely had time to get out of the way as Gatrek wound up and smashed the tube with his axe. Glass shards rode a wave of viscous liquid onto the floor. A body came with it, which Gatrek scooped up with one arm and deposited on the floor nearby. Pale as a worm and barely clad in soiled rags, it looked like a dwarf, but its face was grossly distended into a muzzle with a disturbingly humanoid nose at the end. The hair on his head, and more shamefully, his beard, had been shaved, but new tufts of coarse brown hair grew from his shoulders and back on the nape of his neck. Glorin, said Ulgar, running to his apprentice's side. He knelt quickly and began to treat Glorin's wounds, muttering soothing words as he did. The apprentice gasped in short, hard breaths, as if there was so much liquid in his lungs he couldn't draw in enough air. Felix couldn't believe his eyes. It was difficult to recognize the young apprentice. He'd heard of creatures in Sylvania that were half-wolf and half-man, and even had a close brush with a mutant or two who might have looked like Glorin did now. But dwarves were notoriously resistant to mutation. What had Skaven done to him, and why? Ulgar's calming words had an effect on the apprentice. Glorin's breathing slowed. 
by Grunny's hammer and forge. Malbach took a few tentative steps towards the pair. He looked genuinely distraught. Glorin had been the one who saved Malbach from a similar fate. If not for his sacrifice, it would be the engineer lying on the floor with the face of a monster. Ulgar looked up at Malbach as he knelt beside him and quickly covered up a flash of annoyance when he saw the expression on the engineer's face. What's wrong with him? asked Malbach of the master runesmith. He is cursed, said Ulgar bitterly. He touched Glorin's distorted cheek and then yanked his hand away as if it had been burned. Does Skaven have some foul magic at their disposal? But I've rarely seen them work on Dowie. Perhaps this foul liquid eased the transformation. For what purpose, I can't begin to guess. Can you fix him? Malbach's voice was small and loaded with guilt. Sometimes the best cure is a quick and merciful death, boy, answered Ulgar, even though Malbach was far from a boy. Did you know about this room? asked Wulfheim of Balir, anger flaring. The armory is near here, and I passed through this room in my flight, but never would I have guessed its purpose admitted the long beard. If I had, I would have never left it intact. We'll destroy these tanks and make sure that no dwarf ever again shares Glorin's fate, said Nori Wolfheim. Wait, said Felix. He ignored the dwarf's stares as he looked down at the spot Malbach had just vacated. The engineer had left behind Tebur's great cask of black powder. The way back was sealed, leaving only one other entrance to this room. If they could somehow lure the Skaven here and then detonate the keg, they might be able to even the odds. Ulgar, he said, you told us that the rune Balir saw above the armory door barred entry to anyone but a dwarf. Aye, said the runesmith suspiciously. Tazuk the Mad, said Felix to himself. His mind was racing. Skaven wearing dwarf skins, a curse designed to turn a dwarf into a skaven. It all made a twisted kind of sense now. Tazuk wanted the weapons of Karaktam so desperately that he became unhinged. When the skaven were unable to enter the vault, he tried to fool the rune by dressing his own warriors in Dawi skins. Transforming young Glorin into a skaven was merely the latest iteration of Tazuk's madness. What are you thinking, Manling? rumbled Gautrek. But Felix was too caught up in his own thoughts to pay heed to the dangerous undercurrent in the Slayer's tone. How many prisoners were in your group, Ancient One? he asked of the Longbeard. Balir scratched his head and glared at the ceiling as if the answer could be found among the shadows. Two score? Maybe more? Two score? Hadn't Balir told them earlier that it was possible that some of those dwarves were already inside the armory? That they'd been smart enough not to come back? I need to see the armory, he said. Gatrek, Felix and Balir knelt near a stone balcony overlooking the armory of Karak Tam. The room below them had obviously been intended as a last defense of the armory's treasures and was littered with cunningly placed stone benches that could quickly be overturned to offer cover from archers, while leaving a killing field in front of the massive door that guarded the armory. Tazuk stood on a central dais, holding the Book of Grudges before him, exhorting his followers with all the fanaticism of a warrior priest and all the majesty of a squeaking rat. He was the same grey seer who had ambushed them at a river close to the start of their quest. The line of piercings that ran up his snout could not be mistaken. He was still wearing his armor of finger bones and his skull helmet. He looked like something old, newly arisen from the grave. The door to the armory of Karaktam stood nearly twenty feet high and twenty more across. Just as I thought, he said, the door is closed. What are you getting at, Manling? asked Gotrek. 
The door is sealed, he said, indicating the vault. Why would a Skaven do that? They want inside so badly it's driven them mad. He drew back from the balcony and kept his voice low. The Skaven have been sending dwarves inside to retrieve Karaktam's weapons. But, like you said, no dwarf would ever raid a rat. I think Balir is right. I think there are Dowie inside the armory. They would be in rough shape, but if we could get word to them that we're here to help, it might help to even up the odds, said Balir thoughtfully. Is there any way to alert them of our presence? asked Felix. Certainly, Manling, said Godric with a grin. We fight our way through fifty Skaven and then knock. Felix looked back the way they'd come. A Skaven sentry lay on the floor in a pool of blood. Its head was a few feet away. Fifty on three were poor odds indeed. But he couldn't help thinking that the Slayer had gone against much worse, and won. We could use Grundlid, offered Balir. Grundlid? Hammer tongue. It's a tapping language we use to convey meaning through the rocks themselves. The longbeard glanced at the Skaven below, and, seeing that most watched Tazuk with rapt attention, he stole to the rear of the balcony and selected a section of the wall that appeared to be cut from solid bedrock. He tapped it quietly with the pommel of his dagger, and then waited, with his hand pressed against the rock. Though Felix listened for some response, none came. In the chamber below, Tazuk squeaked viciously, and a dozen Skaven warriors thrust their fists at the ceiling. How long until one of them looked up and spotted the three of them skulking about on the landing, he didn't know. How long until the sentry was missed? Maybe it might be better to simply abandon the plan and retreat back to the other room. Balir's face lit up. They are responding! Felix realized he'd been holding his breath and let it out slowly. Balir replied with a complex code of short and long taps, and then awaited another response. They are two score in number, and starving to a point where they just want to slay the Skaven before they die. Unfortunately, they're not able to open the door from the inside. We will have to open it from this side then said Godric with a grin, that said he'd like nothing more than to leap into the Skaven horde and hack his way to the door. We will have to fight our way there, said Balir gruffly. That big one worries me. He nodded at the hulking mass of rat flesh that stood next to Tazuk. The rat slayer was not quite as tall as some of the other rat ogres in the room, but he was twice as wide as any of them. Felix could tell that he was built like a dwarf, as if Tazuk had somehow managed to combine the best of both races. A golden hammer hung from his belt, the weapon Ulgar called the Flame Hammer. How do we get here from the armory door and then hold it long enough for the dwarfs to open it from the inside? Felix asked to no one in particular. They would have to fight their way through the entire horde to reach the door and, as good a fighter as Godric was, not even he could fight all of them. If only there was some kind of disguise that would allow them to pass through the Skaven unseen. He scanned the balcony, looking for some inspiration, and his gaze alighted on the slain Skaven sentry. A horrible thought occurred to him. I think I know how we can do it, he said. Felix had felt so confident in his plan back on the balcony. But now, facing seven dwarves, some of them badly injured, he almost laughed at how ludicrous it was. If any of them had suggested an alternate course of action, he would have probably taken it. Well, spit it out, man Leng, said Gotrek. Felix cleared his throat and adjusted his chain shirt with a roll of his shoulders. Gotrek was right. If he didn't spit it out, he would lose his nerve. All right. The Skaven outnumber us fifty to one, and when the rats we didn't kill in the antechamber join up with Tazuk, it'll be even worse. We need to strike now, before that happens. Strike? There's only eight of us, said Malbach. 
He had lost the wine from his voice since he'd seen what Escaven had done to Glorin, but he was not stupid. Yes, said Felix hastily. But we do have Tebur's black powder bomb. A smaller amount than that killed almost everything in the other room. If we can somehow lure the Skaven here, we'll retreat down the side passage and seal it behind us. Once we're out of the blast area, we'll set off Tebur's bomb, kill the Skaven, and bury those poor souls in the tanks all at the same time. That is a fine plan, but it has at least one flaw, said Wolfheim. What's to stop them from simply retreating back the way they came? Well, that's where Malbach comes in, said Felix reluctantly. Me? Malbach exclaimed. Balir used hammer tongue to communicate with the dwarves inside the armory. Although they're few in number, they pledge to attack the Skaven from behind. But they can't open the door from the inside. He looked to Balir for support. The longbeard nodded to him to go on. Someone needs to go past the army of the Skaven and open the door. Malbach's face and cheeks reddened with indignation. You want me to fight through an army of crazy ratmen to secure the aid of a handful of starving dwarves? Sounds like a job for a slayer, reasoned Martinuk. Aye, said Gotrek, his face splitting into a wicked smile. But if I took the position, the Skaven would die before they got to the room. Felix glared at the mercenary before turning back to Malbach. We will need every available warrior to block the side passage. What good is it to close the back door if the rats can escape in the front? You've seen me fight, said Malbach in disgust. I won't get more than five paces before they cut me down. Felix felt bad bullying the engineer, but he agreed with Malbach's self-assessment. He was useless with a blade. On the other hand, the side corridor was wide enough that it would take the rest of the fighters to hold it against the Skaven. Felix hated himself for what he was about to do, but the engineer was the only one they could spare. You won't have to fight, he said reluctantly. Gatra cast a bloody lump at Malbach's feet. The dark brown fur of the Skaven sentry he'd killed was stained with gore and smelled like copper and offal. Gotrek's axe was eternally sharp, but it was meant for killing Skaven, not skinning them. Chunks of flesh still clung to the fur. I got the idea from the Skaven, Felix explained. It is crude, but if we create enough of a distraction, it should get you past them, provided you stick to the shadows. What about the smell? asked Wolfheim dubiously. The Reckoner stared at the skin morbidly and nudged it with his toe. You can't seriously be considering, exclaimed Malbach in alarm. Gotrek held up a few brownish sacks, crisscrossed with a web of purplish veins. That's what these scaven glands are for. He seemed to be taking too much pleasure in Malbach's predicament. They call it the musk of fear. Maybe it'll cure your stink. Despite the protest of Malbach, it had taken surprisingly little to get him to wear the Skaven skin. Felix had noticed a change come over the engineer ever since they found Glorin. Malbach was still a braggart and a coward, but it seemed that the sight of the apprentice runesmith's ruined face had aged him years and years. In poor light and with a little luck, said Wolfheim as he stepped away from the engineer, you could pass for a Skaven warrior. I don't see a difference, said Gotrek with a bark of laughter. Malbach glared daggers at him, but said nothing, smoldering quietly. Felix eyed the others. Gromnir shrugged while Gotrek merely grinned. It would take more than poor light for the most blind of ratmen to recognize Malbach as anything but a dwarf. The Skaven sentry had been rail thin, as most Skaven were, while the engineer was heavy set even for a dwarf. Wolfheim had done his best to cure the skin with a torch, but it still showed enough blood to make Malbach look like it sustained a mortal wound. They'd scooped out the ratman brains, but its skull was far too small for Malbach's head, and he wore it like an ill-fitting hat. 
Worst of all, he smelled like a tannery. Felix had a sneaking suspicion that the so-called Moscow fear was something that approximated urine. Felix mouthed a silent prayer to Sigmar that the Skaven would be struck by a sudden and inexplicable plague of blindness. Otherwise, the mission of Malbach would be very short-lived indeed. Balir returned from setting up Tebur's keg, wiping out his hands on a dirty white cloth. Your thunderer knew his black powder. We should be well away from here when Dad goes off, he said, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. In the days before he'd taken the hammer, he'd been something of a thunderer himself, or at least so he told them. After watching him work, Felix began to believe him. Balir's training had returned with record speed. Tebur had been organized if nothing else and had packed the charges and blasting caps necessary to set off the bombs in the same pack. Balir had examined it with a critical eye, pronounced it adequate, and commenced to work. While Balir tampered with the keg, Nori Wolfheim and Ulgar had done what they could to hasten Glorin's spirit into the afterlife. Interrupted mid-transformation, the apprentice died shortly after Gatrick had broken the tank. To Felix, that was a mercy. Life in that state was too horrible to contemplate. They didn't dare to set fire to the body with the Skaven so close. Gotrek had dispatched a few sentries, and soon Tazu could begin to notice their absence. Instead, they placed him close to Tebur's keg. It was undignified, but it would still do the job. While the others made their preparations, Felix tried to pen an entry in the journal, an entry that might as well be his last if the plan failed. He tried putting his pen to paper, but found he couldn't write. The words of Martinuk rang in his ears. Was Gotrick a criminal? He had to know. He found a slayer leaning against a wall, chewing on some hard tack. Gotrick? he asked nervously. The slayer had never been very forthcoming about the events surrounding his shame, and Felix worried that he would once again be rebuffed. Why does King Grundadrak hold a grudge against you? The slayer glared at him as he munched his heart tack. That is none of your concern, manling. Felix nodded and turned away, but one moment later he turned back. He struggled to find the words to describe what he was feeling, to sum up the conflict he felt. At last he gave up. I have to know, he said simply. Gotrek studied him. Felix couldn't begin to guess what was going on in the dwarf's head. It was for a slayer and a slayer only to know his shame. Felix had violated centuries of tradition simply by asking. Perhaps Gotrek read something in Felix's expression that he'd never seen before, because, finally, he spoke. Well, you'd better have a seat then. Felix sat and waited patiently for the slayer to continue. The road to Karakadren is long, and I didn't travel directly to the shrine of Grimnir after... Godric trailed off, eyes growing distant. Though Baragvar was not directly in my path, it was one of the places I came to before I swore the oath. I'd run into a druky raider in some nameless port, and by the time I'd cut off his third finger, he told me that Grundadrak's predecessor had had a hand in my shaming. Godric cracked his knuckles one by one as the thoughts returned to the events which had taken place all those years ago. My wounds were still fresh, and I was mad with rage. The gods recognized me from my former employment as the royal engineer, and since I hadn't taken the oath yet, they didn't realize the danger their king was in. His face twisted into a snarl, and his fist crashed into his palm. He knew when he found me waiting for him in his chambers why I'd come. He didn't even call for his guards. Instead, he only laughed, like it was some great joke. I left him in a pool of his own blood, but I couldn't wipe that grin off his face. 
It stayed frozen on his corpse. Felix's heart grew cold. Had Godric just confessed to murder? Had he killed the previous king of Baragvar in cold blood? No wonder Nori Wolfheim tracked him across half the world over two decades. What part did he play in your shaming? Felix asked. Godric looked at him sharply. That is not for you to know, manling. I must know, Felix said, for the epic. Godric shrugged. Then I release you from your oath. Felix shook his head. It's not that. I just need to know if the king's death was justified. I could swear an oath to you that it was, said Godric. But after all our travels together, you either trust me or you don't. With that, he rose and walked away. Felix watched him go, his emotions in turmoil. Godric had killed the previous king of Baragvar in cold blood. But did that actually make him a murderer? After all our travels together, you either trust me or you don't. In all these years, Godric had left a bloody trail across half the world, but he'd never killed an innocent. He was a complicated dwarf. Martinuk had called the Grim Brotherhood a selfish bunch, but Godric had time and time again sacrificed a glorious death to right some wrong. His code of honor compelled it. You either trust me or you don't. Could he trust Godric? Who better to trust, though? Every moment the Slayer lived was evidence that he cared for causes greater than himself. Felix felt as if a great weight had been lifted from his shoulders. Inspired, he unslung his pack and retrieved the journal from its oiled pack. He put his pen to paper and the words began to flow. It was some of the finest prose he'd ever written.